oh, Box Elders just came in. And welcome to promoting beneficial insects and natu natural pest control. Just you, you control it, Kelly? Yes, it's, okay. it's taking a little bit of time. There we go. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Shane Bougea. Shane is a local University of Minnesota Extension Educator, Extension Educator in Blue Earth and Lesur County, and has been in this role since 2017. He has an MS in Soil Science and a BS in Agronomy from Iowa State University, and he specializes in insects, invasive species, and urban forestry. And in his free time, Shane likes to garden, hike and what I naturalist with photos of bugs and plants. Mm -hmm. As you're I'm looking at your screen, if you want or need to have closed caption, there's a closed caption or CC button at the bottom of your Zoom window. And depending upon your device, you may have it, it have to hover over the bottom of your screen. And if you did not see the CC button, try looking for the button with the three dots and it says more, and once you find the caption button, click on clicking on it toggles the captions on or off. My name is Kelly Kunkel, and I'm an extension educator in health and nutrition. And this is part of our family friendly earth care series. And Shane has been a, a repeat presenter um, on different topics for farm, family friendly earth care. And later you'll be getting a link to the evaluation. Please evaluate the webinar, but also if you can think of other topics that you want to see and hear about, please let us know on those topics. So with that, it's my great pleasure to turn it over to Shane. All right. Well, thanks, Kelly, for that nice introduction. It's good to see everybody here. I always enjoy talking uh, about all of those things I mentioned in the, in the bio, but uh, insects and specifically beneficial insects are one of my favorites. So this is kind of the general outline of our presentation today. Uh, we're gonna first learn kind of what does it mean to be a beneficial insect? Uh, how can we attract and keep them on our farms and gardens and yards? And what are the limitations to uh, natural enemies or, or beneficial insects? So we'll go right off the dot here. And um, you can kind of break them down into three different classes. So when I think of beneficial insects, these are kind of the things I think of in general. So of course we have pollinators, very popular, um, great. A lot of bumblebee fans in the, in the chat, it seems like. Um, but they're very, very important for uh, plant life. And not only just increasing our food that uh, we eat, uh, but also the diversity of plant life. There are lots and lots and lots of plants that require insects to move their genetic material from one place to another helps hybridize things and make things uh, more vigorous. So they really are a key to um, quite a lot of what we see in our daily life. Natural enemies. Uh, so these are the ones that you're probably all here for. They're the, they're the uh, predators of insect pests. They're, uh, they can also be pollinators, some of them less so than others. Um, most of the time bees and bumblebees are gonna be uh, the kings and queens of that arena. Uh, but they do have some natural enemies can pollinate a little bit, and we might dive into that a bit. And then last but certainly not least are things like decomposers. So these are uh, insects that uh, bring mat organic material back into the soil, uh, which over time releases nutrients for our plants. Uh, I mean, these would include things uh, like dung beetles that I have in, the, in, in this little corner here. Um, but there's also other things that you may not think about. And usually you think of cockroaches as really nasty pests. And when they get into our house, they are. Uh, but there is a lot of native cockroaches that help decompose wood uh, and other uh, decaying materials in your woods. That would never be an issue in your kitchen. But so they're, they're, they might be the most uh, misunderstood out of the three, I would say. But as we mentioned, we're going to focus just on our natural enemies today. So why should you care about them? Um, so natural enemies are a form of biological pest control. So uh, one way to think about it, it's a living thing serving as a check on another living thing. And beneficial insects that are uh, natural enemies can provide a lot of services to us humans. $13 billion value in the United States. A lot of times a, a pest uh, can end up being eaten by one of these as, as one of the main ways it dies in nature. 
Uh, and there's usually not many direct costs, though many of these insects are present in your yard and garden uh, with some caveats. Uh, and as a side note, you know, there was some, maybe some talk earlier about, you know, is it good if I buy uh, natural enemies from a store and release them in my garden? Um, so when we talk about these creatures, these are living things that are hungry all the time. <laughs> it seems like they're hungry all the time. Uh, but if you don't have a lot of pests in your garden and you release these animals out there, they're going to move and they're going to find places that do. So a lot of times when people order um, beneficial insects in the mail, uh, they work really good in greenhouses or places where it's hard for them to, to leave. And one of the other good things about natural enemies is that they are good against resistant pests. So pests that are resistant to uh, certain types of insecticides, there are plenty of those, including this aphid over here. Uh, there are some aphids that are resistant to many of our common insecticides, uh, but they're probably not as resistant to the jaws of that, uh, or mandibles, I should say, of that ladybug. Uh, so they might be really tough and resistant to your powders and sprays, but not so much when it comes to a ladybug's mouth. And we can divide natural enemies further into two big classes. Uh, so both of these help control pests. One of them is kind of what we think of when we think of a, of a beneficial insect, natural enemy, something that just eats, straight up eats uh, the pest. That would be your ladybugs. Those would be considered predators. Just like we would think of a cheetah or a lion as a predator of another animal, uh, these insects are out there to eat uh, and eat them they will. The other one that's perhaps less well known is something called a parasitoid. And a lot of these are wasps, but not all. And uh, they're very different in, in terms of how they control uh, pests. And we'll talk a little bit about how later. So again, predators. These are the things we think of. They eat other insects. Most of the time, hopefully pests, although you will see some of these beneficial insects eat something that you may want to keep in your garden landscape, but they're living creatures, they're animals. Um, many are generalists. That's what we call, you know, they're not picky about their food. Uh, they tend to be a little bit not picky anyway. Uh, they're usually the ones that you'll find in the garden. Um, and you know, I have uh, some uh, ladybug larva in the top right there, and then a pirate bug on the bottom right. Both are eating aphids. Uh, but as I kind of alluded to earlier, if you don't have food there, if you don't have pests there, your predators will leave. Um, again, their animal, animals are not going to stay there and work for you necessarily. Uh, they're living things that are just going to have their own uh, own priorities. So ladybugs. So the one common one we see probably most often is our multicolored Asian lady beetle, who is uh, an imported insect um, that's brought over. And you might see this a lot in your gardens or in farm fields. And one of the easiest ways to identify a multicolored Asian lady beetle is to look for the University of Minnesota M right by its head there. Uh, their pattern and dots may be different, colors might be different, but they tend to have that M on their head. And if you look at it from a different point of view, maybe it reminds you of Wisconsin, uh, but no, it's uh, University of Minnesota M, I think. So those are the uh, life stages down there. It's kind of interesting. So you'll see eggs there uh, hatching. And then um, over here in this middle one, this is the one that looks very, very different from its adult form. This is the larval form of the ladybug. Uh, and this is just as voracious and has a big appetite as the adult. And you'll see this one also working on your garden and landscape. And then once they start to get old enough, they will turn into a pupil, uh, pupa. And this kind of has a weird prongy things that are coming out near the head. It is also another kind of weird thing to look at at a leaf. But over time, they'll eventually hatch into um, an adult uh, ladybug that is doing work in your garden. And unfortunately, probably in your house uh, hanging out uh, as the multicolored Asian lady beetle is. A lot of native lady beetles um, prefer not to overwinter in your house. So I'm not casting a bad picture about them. I'm just trying to show some of the uh, more common ones you might see in your landscape. Pirate bugs. So this one's kind of confusing. These are ones that um, are really good predators. They're a certain type of insect that has almost like a beak. 
and it'll go right through and hit uh, a small uh, pest, maybe like an aphid or a white fly or something along those lines. And uh, these are the ones where if there's not a lot of food out there, they may try you and see what you taste. So generally in the late fall, maybe after harvest, you'll see a lot of these little guys out there. Uh, some people call them noceums, uh, but noceum can mean a couple of different insects or, or other creatures. But uh, a lot of times when people say it, it's usually in the end of fall and it's probably one of these guys. And they're very tiny, very, very tiny. So if this picture over here kind of gives you a scale, that is a penny and that's how small these little guys are. Um, they don't really hurt you besides the initial pain, but they can be kind of annoying. However, they are a beneficial insect that's doing work in the garden. These are probably my favorites um, or one of my favorites. Now, a person in the comments mentioned this already, but I have here the great golden digger wasp. Uh, this one is grabbing a katydid or a grasshopper. These are wasps that are predators. So they will uh, kill or paralyze a um, uh, a creature and bring it back to the nest for their young. And there are quite a lot of diverse wasps that uh, can do this. This is, you might have heard of this one. Uh, this is the smoky winged beetle bandit. This is a native um, insect that occasionally preys on wood boring beetles, including emerald ash borer. Um, and uh, I don't know why this is doing that. Okay, uh, and then you have dark paper wasp, which <clears throat> uh, you might see also also can do some work uh, in the uh, in the garden. The great black wasp as well, you'll see that a lot uh, in our neck of the woods. Kind of almost with these two, you kind of see these together at least in Mankato where I'm at. And then there's also a lot of ones, even the yellow jackets that cause us all sorts of problems. They do in fact prey on other insects, including pests. And a lot of times these wasp predators can gather a lot of insects. So um, this one over here is one of our grass, a grass carrier wasps. A lot of times you'll see kind of like a little urn almost of, of woven grasses. Uh, and inside you'll find a lot of paralyzed uh, prey that it has gathered for its young. Sometimes you might see this if you're ripping out an old um, trim from a barn you'll see these weird little urns of wrapped grass. It's probably one of those grass wasps. Uh, the one on the right here, this one was kind of sliced uh, as a side view. Now this is not necessarily, uh, if you don't, spiders are beneficial uh, creatures, but uh, in this case, this wasp was gathering uh, spiders to store later for its young. And you can see how many she can fit in there in the little cell. And then that's her young right there, her larva. So they can gather quite a lot, including aphids. So this is an aphid wasp that's doing the same thing. It's caching or storing insects for its uh, babies to munch on uh, and develop. Ground beetles. Now these are ones, we get a lot of calls in the extension office about ground beetles, particularly this tiger beetle. Uh, a lot of people are worried that it's a uh, emerald ash borer or something along those lines. Uh, but these are actually very beneficial. So a lot of beetles that you find scurrying across your garden uh, or your farm are really beneficial in a lot of ways. And not only do they usually eat things that just, a lot of times these beetles are really good for insects or pest insects that fall to the ground uh, and then they get preyed upon by these beetles. So you see a lot of these types of critters that are on the, on the ground can, can be really an asset to you and your garden. Um, also, some of them may, eat weed seeds as well. So they kind of have an herbivore versus um, uh, predatory uh, response. So you can see a lot of these guys in the garden. It's There's so many to identify. You can't even go on species. Uh, tiger beetle is an exception, but for the most part, they're going to look kind of like this guy here in general. And then we also have some other predators that are maybe not so obvious. So <clears throat> we think of stink bugs as being really kind of a pest. And there are quite a few stink bugs that do eat uh, plants. However, there are a certain number of stink bugs that eat insects. And this is a great uh, uh, a photo of, of some of these insects at work. We talked a little bit about the beaks 
that the um, pirate bug has. It's a very similar thing with these stink bugs. They'll stick uh, a pest and, um, and eat them that way. And it, it's, again, it can be hard to identify stink bugs. The ones in Minnesota that I tend to see that are, are helpful have really sharp pointed shoulders. Um, but again, it's not straightforward. And if you have questions, you can always stop by your extension office or talk to your master gardeners. And then uh, another thing we have in the middle here is ambush bugs. Uh, ambush bugs are, are really an interesting creature. Uh, they kind of almost looks like a praying mantis if you look up, but they have that same mouth part as the stink bug. Uh, so they'll hide in flowers a lot of times and grab an insect uh, and then feed on, upon them. And then uh, last here is something called robber flies. And these are another really interesting predator in that they tend to catch uh, insects that are kind of in the air or kind of uh, jumping around. And uh, they also can kind of do the same thing where they pierce the insect and start feeding on it. Uh, but robber flies, a lot of times they might be hanging uh, off, a, off, off a blade of grass or something. Uh, but they're also an interesting example of a beneficial fly. Some of these beneficial insects are only predators as larvae. So insects, some insects have many different life stages. Uh, so a good example is this hoverfly, a surfid flower. You, surfid fly, you might see this a lot on your flowers in your garden. Uh, they are also beneficial. So when they're in their maggot form or larval form, you might see them as kind of this little slug-like thing, uh, but they are in fact preying upon certain insects, in this case, aphids. So uh, in this case, the adult is not predatory. Uh, so he or she is going on and gathering uh, pollen and nectar for, for uh, their nutrition. But when they are larva, uh, they're going to be hungry for pests. And this is a good way for these animals, uh, a strategy to keep these animals um, doing well in the landscape because they can have different sources of food at different times of year. That really kind of helps their odds in nature. And some can be predators in all life stages. Now, some lacewings um, cannot or do not eat aphids as adults. Uh, others can. So <clears throat> you can see uh, this really kind of weird alligator-like creature, which you probably also see on your gardens quite a bit, um, definitely eats aphids. Uh, when it gets to an adult form, it might also munch on aphids, uh, given depending on the species. So again, uh, ladybugs kind of also fit this vein where they're predators as larvae, predators as adults. And speaking of ladybugs, sometimes they can be vegetarians on occasion. So a really good example is this 12-spotted lady beetle. So this is a native lady beetle in Minnesota. Um, they really uh, can have a good amount of their diet come from pollen. So if you're ever in a cornfield, uh, a lot of times you'll find these guys out in a cornfield eating the pollen uh, in those farm fields. And, um, and then also with multicolored Asian lady beetles, if there's really no pests around, they can cause damage to soft uh, fruits and in particular certain types of berries. So this is kind of where um, if you don't have the food that they want, uh, it can kind of push them to go elsewhere or maybe in this case, maybe bring them to something that you don't want them to do. I kind of gave a hint about what we were going to talk about with parasitoids. Um, so parasitoids are really different from predators in that a lot of times their life cycle, they can't complete their life cycle without killing a host or a plant or a insect host. So they're not parasites per se, they're parasitoids. A lot of times parasites don't necessarily have to kill their host, uh, but most parasitoids or a lot of parasitoids do. They're more specific than predators, and that can be a good and a bad thing. Uh, it's good in that they're only attacking maybe that one bad pest that you don't want, uh, it, and that could be very good. Uh, but if you don't have that pest and there's not a lot of, of of that pest around, they're going to be even more likely to split and, and leave you. A lot of times, not always, adult parasitoids usually are vegetarians. 
so to speak. So you might see uh, a lot of, so we'll show you more wasps uh, that kind of fit this. And a lot of wasps are parasitoids, but they may require flowers more for their daily needs in terms of food. And only um, their young are kind of this sort of predator type uh, stage. So kind of think of them like the movie Alien, okay? There's something inside you and coming out. Uh, that's the best way to kind of describe what a parasitoid is. And here's a nice little comic um, that uh, we share around uh, the office. So we have this wasp here, this aphid wasp. Uh, you have the uh, aphid itself. She'll lay the egg inside of the aphid. It will um, it will gestate inside it and then eat it from the inside out as a wasp. So um, that's this is a nice uh, uh, illustration of of what they're doing. How many people have seen this maybe in their garden? If you have uh, tobacco or, or tomato hornworms that are munching on your tomatoes and you see these little furry uh, urns all over the uh, body of the insect, that is uh, almost certainly a type of parasitoid wasp. And when we think of wasps, we think of like, you know, yellow jackets or big giant cicada killers. Uh, in this case, these are really tiny. Um, these types of, of, of wasps are very small, but they can lay lots of, inject lots of those little eggs into the hornworm. Uh, and eventually it will kill the hornworm and these little wasps will uh, emerge out of those urns. So if you see uh, like the cap popped off, uh, that means that the insect has in fact left. Uh, so this hornworm is not feeling great. Uh, and it just uh, <laughs> is going to keep trucking along, but until it uh, it can't anymore. Another thing, and this is kind of me nerding out here, um, is that these wasps also have a certain virus that serves as a um, symbiotic relationship of sorts. So this type of wasp that preys on hornworms that we just saw, uh, it will shoot out virus along with its egg. And this virus helps stop the hornworm from going into its chrysalis or pupa. And um, uh, in what it also does is it slows or stops the movement. It hurts the immune system response. Uh, so the virus is working with the wasp to help uh, her uh, have a, a good start for her young. So this is just crazy stuff, uh, and but it's nature is so uh, wonderful in, in, in a lot of ways, but uh, this is something that's really uh, kind of out there. Another thing about wasp parasitoids is that they can be very small and then they can be very big. So the one that one of the smallest insects that we know about is a uh, fairy wasp, and uh, these are really, really tiny, uh, you know, tiny, tiny critters, and you almost need a microscope to even see them. Uh, if at this stage, they're when they're this small, their wings have certain structures on them because it's like flying in syrup to them. Uh, the air is more of like, much more of like a fluid. So they're, they're, uh, their physiology is kind of different for that reason, which is also crazy. We've seen this one, or I've seen this one too in the woods, this great Ichimon wasp. This is another parasitoid that can uh, uh, attack uh, certain uh, wood boring in, uh, insects. The ovipositor, which is what we, uh, which is how she lays eggs inside the insect host. This one is three inches long and she's two inches long. So you're almost looking at a, a critter that's almost, you know, six, half a foot long. So um, again, lots of diversity in wasps. Uh, they're one of my favorite type of insects just because of all of these crazy things. All right, but we can't leave out, it's not just wasps. There's another big cohort of parasitoids that are the fly parasitoids. Uh, these are um, basically, they all look very similar to this where they have these stiff hairs on them. Uh, and uh, what they'll do is that they'll lay eggs on the outside of insects. Yes, this is a Japanese beetle. We will talk about that a little bit later. Uh, but as those eggs hatch, the, uh, the larval form will go inside of the host in that way. 
So there's a couple, this here's a stink bug, but uh, again, very important part of our beneficial insect friends. And uh, to get things even weirder, so not only are there parasitoids of maybe aphids, but there are parasitoids for the parasitoids of the aphid. Uh, so this is just kind of a fun thing. It's called a hyperparasitoid. Uh, and this illustration kind of shows you that crazy thing where you'll see uh, the wasp that we saw earlier putting an egg inside the aphid. Another wasp will come and lay an egg inside the egg that's in the aphid. <laughs> and then once that uh, original parasitoid emerges, it also uh, succumbs to the hyperparasitoid. Uh, so generally, if you have hyperparasitoids in your area, you have a pretty diverse landscape, in other words. But it does impact pest control to a, some extent. Okay, now that we talked a little bit about it and I nerded out a little bit about wasps and parasitoids, now we're going to get to the meat of the presentation, which is how can we attract a lot of these beneficial insects and keep them on our property. So I kind of break things down when I'm thinking about how to make a, a good home for beneficial insects. Do they have enough food and do they have an area where they can spend the cold months of the winter? Uh, so you kind of break it down to food, shelter. So pollen and nectar, uh, a lot of beneficial insects rely on that. Some of those parasitoids that we mentioned are, are one of those where most of the adult forms are vegetarians and they need that material to survive. And then uh, also having a habitat for other insects, maybe not just the pests, uh, but other insects there to serve as a secondary food source uh, when there may not be an outbreak uh, at that given moment. With shelter, it's pretty straightforward. Plant residue, uh, you can use cover crops in your garden to keep things covered. Uh, prairies, woodlands, all of those are great uh, to have places for uh, insects to overwinter. So one of these things, and we'll share this uh, at the end, I'll, I'll give some stuff to Kelly, um, but this is Midwest Cover Crop Council. This is something that you can, farmers can use, but also gardeners. And if you're looking at playing around with cover crops in your vegetable garden, this is something that can be really helpful for you to pick uh, plants that uh, not only do uh, hold the soil together and help with the soil health, but also uh, bring in some of those beneficial insects. Now, not all of these are, are, some are better than others in terms of beneficial insects. And we'll, we'll talk about uh, some of my favorites coming up here. So these are some photos that I took a few years ago. Um, now, I... Full disclosure, this, this uh, little plot of garden land was in Iowa, so zone five, uh, but still uh, we sowed some crimson clover in the fall. Uh, we didn't really expect it to overwinter, uh, but it did. The winter was very mild. And then uh, as it emerged, we had a really nice crimson clover crop, crop that not only brought in tons of nitrogen because it's a legume and makes its own nitrogen, bring in tons of nitrogen for our tomato crop, which we had some of the best tomatoes we've ever had in the strip. It also provided flowers for insects as well. And you can notice that uh, there are <laughs> uh, some deer and rabbits uh, also had their, uh, their fun too, but uh, for the most part, we were really happy with what the cover crop did in our garden. Other cover crops that can be really good that kind of fulfill that food, that nectar, pollen uh, type of resource. Uh, these are some of my favorites here. So lacy facelia or uh, bee's friend. Uh, another word for it is scorpion weed. It's native to the Southwest United States, uh, but you can find it here a lot in um, a lot of garden stores, Johnny seeds, that type of thing. Uh, they have a really nice long bloom period. And this is a uh, I think it's a, maybe a mason bee that was hanging out uh, on when I was growing uh, in, my, in my Mankato uh, <laughs> apartment, uh, but it really is a great resource. Sweet alyssum is another one I really like. Not only does it smell wonderful, uh, it's pretty easy to, to sow and grow. And one of the things we didn't really get into too much is that the flowers are really shallow. And a lot of the beneficial insects that we want to bring to our garden 
um, that are that are also pest control, they tend not to have really long tongues like uh, bees and bumblebees might have. So having these shorter uh, flowers like sweet alyssum and having a really long bloom time are really great uh, for for making it making it easy on our on our uh, parasitoids and, and predators. And then uh, common buckwheat is also a really good insect uh, bringer. Uh, it's a little weedier than these two. Um, so you got to watch it, make sure it doesn't get to seed because it will uh, be a little bit annoying later on in the year if you don't have a good control on it. Um, but uh, another really powerful one. And it's a better, one of the things that buckwheat has over these other two is that it's pretty competitive with weeds. So if you have a really weedy patch in your garden, uh, buckwheat might be a good option uh, if you want to have insect habitat and you want to have a little bit of weed control. But again, a lot of these are sown in times where you might want to have vegetables being out there and growing. Uh, so again, it's kind of, you know, where can you put it? How does it fit into your rotation? Uh, you know, a lot of these might work with things like garlic uh, or other types of plants. And uh, again, with shallow uh, flowers, again, it, it, sometimes you don't even need the cover crop. You can you can grow more herbs that can bring in more insects. Cilantro and dill are kind of the uh, poster children uh, for that. Um, and that can also be a really powerful resource for your parasitoids and beneficials. Some other tips that if you're going to uh, put uh, some more flowering habitat in kind of a garden, so you want to try to make this a working kind of uh, pollinator garden, the closer the better. So the closer you can get those flowers to the actual crop you want to protect, the better. So a lot of times you'll see borders or strips. Uh, again, you want to get that really close because uh, some insects really want to stay kind of nearby uh, things that they have. Um, they want to stay, they don't want to move too, too far to find uh, food. So <clears throat> having those kind of proximity uh, based uh, uh, concerns are some things that you'll have to address. Again, I talked about shallow flowers. A lot of natural enemies have short tongues uh, and don't neglect grass. So remember when we talked about food resources, we also talked about overwintering habitat. Um, grasses are a great way to, to use them to serve as kind of like a little reserve. So when you're out there doing tillage or you're out there mowing, you have a place for these insects to find refuge. And um, in England, they have something called beetle banks, which uh, they have really um, kind of popularized over there. And that's how it serves. It serves as a refuge for ground beetles and other beneficial insects to run uh, and hide, so to speak, as uh, tillage operations and harvesting is going on. And I've kind of seen this too, personally, uh, with some of even high tunnels. So uh, with some vegetable uh, farmers I worked with, they had a patch of, of uh, old kind of overwintered, uh, but still kind of surviving spinach. Uh, and then they had just put in new, the other half of the high tunnel was just planted in small kind of lettuces and things. But you could see the ground beetles were kind of in that, that area between that overwintered crop and the newly planted things. So these things uh, have some science to back them up. If you're looking to bring in native wildflowers, which is also a great option, um, make sure that you're trying to get ones that are kind of adapted to uh, the area of Minnesota that you're at. So <clears throat> the Department of uh, the DNR at Minnesota has really good lists where it gives you lots of different uh, companies to go to if you want to do native planting, which is also, again, like I said, a very good way to bring in uh, beneficials to your uh, landscape. There are other ones that, uh, the, the other one that the DNR has for native uh, plants is, is, is through their Restore Their Shore program, uh, and it's really good, a native plant encyclopedia. So you can kind of pick what types of things you're looking for, uh, kind of the exposure, and it'll bring you native plants uh, specific to the county. In this case, I picked Olmstead County, uh, and I said, you know, upland dry, grasses, wildflowers, full sun, uh, and it gave me a nice list that you can print off or add to a list of your own. Uh, and it also talks about things about, you know, maybe the bloom time and the flower color. 
And then uh, last, uh, we have, and certainly not least, we have the University of Minnesota Extension. Now, this is more of a landscape design type program, but still can be a good, powerful tool to uh, choose adapted flowers and grasses that can help double as pollinator and beneficial insect habitat. We mentioned a little bit about overwintering and kind of cover protection, physical protection for insects. We're thinking the ground beetles. So a lot of times when we go crazy with our rototillers, we're destroying a lot of habitat for some of these animals, like those ground beetles. So <clears throat> maybe trying out a new lower impact tillage system for your garden for a few years, uh, try that out. If you're using mulch, mulch is also really nice for ground beetles, they, they enjoy that. Um, and then on the flip side of things, if you have bare patches in your lawn, uh, you know, obviously we want to make sure that we don't have nothing but bare patches, but learning to tolerate a few bare patches on the lawn is really good for a lot of these wasps we talked about, uh, and also native bees. So this is that smoky winged beetle bandit that we talked about earlier. Uh, this is an emerald ash borer adult. It does kind of like those areas where it's a bare spot on the lawn and it digs a little uh, habitat. So again, uh, the whole idea is in general, when we're talking about residue in the garden and the yard, if you're looking at it in a perspective of an insect, the messier it is, the better, right? Um, so when is the best time to do your spring cleanup? Uh, the timing is really unclear. Uh, it really depends on a lot of different variables. Some people wait until the apples bloom, some as late as tomato planting. Uh, so whatever you do, that's that's fine. The things that we kind of urge people not to do if they're really concerned about pollinator habitat or beneficial insect habitat is taking that residue and removing it completely from your landscape. So if you're bagging it, removing offsite, you're burning it, uh, those tend to be the places, the times and situations where uh, the our insect friends are are not happy because they can't find the place to hide or, or to use. So, of course, there's exceptions for plant diseases. If you have um, residue that is, has been infested with some sort of fungal disease, obviously, we don't want to have that out there uh, because while we do like our beneficial insects, we also like our vegetables that we want to grow. So you kind of look have to look at your priorities in that case. Uh, but in general, messier is better when we're talking about habitat for insects. This is kind of a good example of messy, <laughs> but to an insect, this might look like a, you know, a four-story mansion, right? So this is uh, Mara Dunn. She's a, a biocontrol specialist in New York State. This is kind of her garden, right? So she's going to have some uh, old twigs and, and leaf cover and mulch. This is all great for a lot of the insects that we talked about. And then when we decide to use uh, pesticides on our landscape, because um, our beneficial insects are not, you know, they're not gonna stop everything all the time, right? And sometimes when we use integrated pest management, sometimes we may have to use chemical controls. Uh, the things that I will caution people if you're looking to preserve beneficial insects and pollinators uh, is something that um, or organic products are not necessarily low risk or no risk products to insects. Spinosad is a really good example where bees and wasps can be very negatively affected by that uh, product, even though it might be organic. So just keep that in the back of your mind and make sure you look and do research with, with certain products. Aim for quality rather than quantity. So we all kind of know, <laughs> we may, you may have seen situations where someone like covers everything in seven dust, right? I just got to kill everything in the, so uh, again, urging people to be more selective about when and where they use their products. So using things, BT can be very selective to certain groups of insects, uh, making sure that, you know, even now some farmers uh, practice this, something called trap cropping, where they might have a really attractive plant for the pest. And then as the pests go to that plant, the farmer then sprays that narrow area. So you're concentrating the pests in a certain strip and you're applying a insecticide in a very narrow area compared to the farm. So that could be another tactic that you could try. 
Um, but one of the things that we urge people to do is just because you see one pest insect doesn't necessarily mean you grab uh, the nuclear weapon and deploy it in your garden. A lot of times if you put all these chemical controls way too early um, and don't give natural enemies the chance to find them, uh, you'll kill everything out, out there, including the beneficial insects that we want. Uh, and yes, you killed that one aphid, uh, but a lot of times, and I've seen this in agricultural settings where uh, people may have applied insecticides at a really low threshold or really not damaging to the plant. Uh, and then the insecticide is applied. It's a broad spectrum. It's not selective. It kills the beneficial insects. It kills the aphids, right? So that's, well, it did that job. Uh, but it actually opens the door to other pests that can go into a new area that is lacking competition and lacking predators. So sometimes what we'll see is people apply insecticide too early on aphids. Spider mites might come in later and have a nice habitat with no pressure. So again, just some tips there with chemical control and beneficial insects. Limitations. So I think it's really important to keep things in perspective when we talk about beneficial insects. Uh, they're not a silver bullet uh, necessarily. They can't stop everything and, and be perfect. Um, so there are things that we have to keep in mind if we want to try to increase and bring them to our landscape. So a lot of times scientists will talk about something called landscape complexity. And basically what that is, is in a certain radius, do you have things like grasses? Do you have things like forests? Do you have different types of habitat? Or is it just one type? Uh, in general, insects will be happy if they have kind of a mix of places like grasslands and forests and other things like that. Um, and if we're in kind of a desert of sorts, uh, it can be really hard to bring in beneficial insects. Not impossible, but very hard. And uh, some of the research is kind of, you know, uh, above this or below this, but if about 20% of your landscape within a half mile radius is in complex habitat, so grassland, forest, that type of thing, it might be worth it to put uh, more habitat for beneficial insects and it might pay, quote unquote, to do so. But we have to be aware that sometimes things are out of our control. If we're in a really desolate area, we have to be realistic about how much beneficial insects we can bring to our area. So if you're in kind of a spot in the middle here where there's no, uh, not much landscape complexity, it there might be really good reasons to plant things, uh, pollinators, other types of things, aesthetically, water quality issues. But uh, if you plant your, you know, a small garden there, don't expect to have a massive amount of, of beneficial insect control. You know, maybe something like this where you have a little bit of woods over here and you've got some water and there's some farms and then maybe some grasslands, uh, that might be a good place to say, hey, maybe I can stack the deck a little bit and plant some more beneficial insect habitat. And then kind of on the flip side where you're like in your, like if you're in the middle of a nature reserve and you're completely surrounded by tall grass prairie um sure there's lots of good reasons to plant it but it's kind of like putting a drop in the bucket i mean there's plenty of there's tons of great habitat for these animals to thrive in uh if you have some in your property great uh, but it's not going to necessarily going to bring all of those insects to the one spot that you did that so again things are some things are out of our control see if you can stack the deck Here's some other kind of um, uh, hard cutting truths <laughs> with beneficial insects and natural enemies. Sometimes the crop is more attractive than the habitat that you installed. So remember that 12 spotted lady beetle that we talked about? It's also a beneficial insect. It can eat pest eggs, it can eat pests, uh, but it really, really likes pollen too. And sometimes if you have a crop like corn, it might prefer that to the uh, fancy new habitat that you planted. Sometimes the habitat is more attractive to the crop. 
And sometimes we'll see that with ground beetles. They don't want to venture too far outside of their area. Uh, and they're more than happy just to stay in that strip of, of prairie plants or cover crops or whatever, uh, because there's plenty of food there, there's protection. They don't really want to go uh, in an exposed area, maybe across a footpath to get to your broccoli, right? So sometimes the habitat is very attractive for these beneficial insects and they don't want to move. Other times, if we have some <clears throat> extra floral resources and, and beneficial kind of flowers, some pests might also kind of like that too. Uh, so tarnished leaf bug really does like a lot of those flowers and can get out there and maybe cause some issues for your strawberries. So we've seen that in, in some research. But um, yeah, so you're bringing in insects, right? And not necessarily all of them are good. Sometimes there's few or no natural enemies for the pest. So even if we have a nice utopia for beneficial uh, insects, natural enemies, if you have a really, and typically these are invasive pests, if you have an invasive insect, typically the reason why they're really damaging and invasive is because they don't have natural enemies or controls in the environment. So things like Japanese beetles and uh, uh, brown marmiated stink bugs and, and other types of things where there's really very few natural enemies. We have to be realistic about what, what can happen. And then a lot of times, if you make a decision as a gardener uh, or a farmer, uh, like if you do apply a big uh, a pesticide application and you do have those off-target effects, I mean, that can override your work. So again, focusing on um, uh, integrated pest management strategy is really good. Uh, but, you know, if there's a mistake or something happens, then, then we can get a really bad outcome in terms of all that extra work you did to put that habitat. So, you know, like I said before, harsh insecticides that are that are pretty uh, broad spectrum or not very selective. Sometimes we go crazy with our rototiller. We just rip up everything we want to see. Uh, those can be things that can override our gains. So if we can't solve everything with this, why even bother? Uh, so with beneficial insects, first off, they can help. But second of all, if they don't and you make this uh, habitat for it, there are other things that this is really good for. Water quality, soil health, providing uh, habitat for pollinators like bees. It's also good for your mental health and aesthetics. Those are all very important. Smelling that alyssum, right, in the morning or something like that, that's a nice little boost for the morning. Uh, and also, if you're just relying on biological control or beneficial insects, that's not integrated pest management. That's not what we want to do as gardeners and farmers and landowners. Uh, there are other things that we can do. We can make changes about what crops we plant. Maybe there's a variety of, of tomato that's resistant to a certain pest. Uh, is there a way that we can um, you know, change our tillage? Can we reduce our tillage or other things like that? Um, so again, we have lots of different things we can do. Don't rely on just one thing, and that would include beneficial insects. So the main takeaways for my talk is that natural enemies, so your predators, your parasitoids, are living things, and they're independent things a lot of times. You can't necessarily control them, tell them what to do. Um, they have their own priorities. However, we can stack the deck where possible. So some of the tricks we talked about, bringing those close, those flowers closer to your crop, uh, putting in that new habitat, changing up maybe your pesticide use, your cover crops, your tillage, those types of things. Again, uh, some things are out of our control. We talked about that with the landscape, maybe the surrounding landscape, um, but we can still do our part. And it's really good to kind of pay attention to your surroundings. Go out there in your garden. Do you see, you know, pirate bugs? Do you see lots of wasps, lots of tiny wasps. And if you're seeing a lot of those animals out there, uh, then maybe you can start catering to them a little bit more specifically. That's kind of the main part of my talk, Kelly. Um, so I guess uh, we'll do some questions.
Absolutely. And there's some questions in the chat. Um, mm -hmm. One is, are, you, are Asian lady beetles beneficial in the garden or should I kill them when found? I think they're they're beneficial in the garden, uh, all things considered. So if you're finding, unless they're doing damage to raspberries or other kind of things and you're seeing them eat the raspberries, I would leave them alone. All right. What about Chinese praying mantis? Beneficial or not? Um, they're kind of one of those things. And and this here's my two cents about praying mantis. So um a lot of times you'll find them as a beneficial bug and that's fine. Uh, but depending on what they're eating, um, and a lot of times they're they don't have as big a, an effect as you think compared to things like pirate bugs, where there's so many of them, and lady beetles, where there's so many of them. If you just have a handful, one or two in a in a garden, uh, the impact is is smaller. So I would probably focus on other uh, anim animals. And there's some research that scientists are doing about mantises and how they affect other predators like spiders and other things like that. So I don't think it's a clear cut answer. Right. A question about nematodes. How mm -hmm. do I get them in and keep them happy? We may yeah. have grubs and I hear they're beneficial for that. Yeah, that's a great, I wish I knew more about nematodes. I think there's a lot of research going on. There are, I've seen good things. I've seen bad things with, with nematodes and being applied uh, to certain areas. Um, I can't answer that, unfortunately. Not a nematologist. <laughs> right. Um, interest in that beetle bank. Would yeah. you, um, shrubs and trees work as well as the grasses? Yep. I mean, I think the biggest thing is um, the shrubs, if they have that leaf litter, if you have, you know, if you're mulching the trees and shrubs uh, as part of your horticultural duties, um, I would think that that would be a good refuge for those animals as well. Question about flying ants. They come out about midsummer mm -hmm. out of the ground in hordes. It's like mm -hmm. the ground is alive. Mm -hmm. for a long period, maybe a week. I'm not sure if I should let them do their thing or should I eradicate them? I, I am a fan of letting things do their thing. Um, if they're not in your house, uh, certainly you can get winged ants in your house. A lot of times carpenter ants, this kind of time of year, a few weeks ago, we've gotten calls in the office where you have ants that are winged inside your house. That's a different story. If you're finding things like cicada killers or uh, like you're noticing with, with ants leaving in, uh, in, your, in your yard, if they're not damaging you, your house, your property, I am a fan of leaving things be. Very good. Question about free range chickens. Um, oh, so yeah. Worry about our chickens eating the beneficial bugs while they're free range. Um, I mean, that's a valid concern. Um, the, the birds are not going to check with you first uh, and ask permission to eat. Uh, but I would kind of say uh, the chickens can be good pest control. Certainly, if you're using them maybe in a mobile chicken tractor or something like that. Um, yeah, they'll they'll eat beneficial insects. They'll, they'll eat grasshoppers too, probably. So, I mean, I I, I don't know. <laughs> it probably depends. There's the extension answer. Anything specific about potato beetles? I yeah, I do have. So, um, we got some we got some questions about potato beetles, and and yes, they're a really damaging pests. There's really not a ton of. There has been some research about what natural enemies attack. Uh, Colorado potato beetles. There's two uh, that a lot of research talk about. One is is present in Minnesota. That's the two spotted stink bug. That's a uh, uh, a larva, I believe, of a Colorado potato beetle. It's getting again speared, kind of like that beneficial stink bug. There's another one that's kind of more common in the East Coast, uh, a ground beetle kind of thing that likes to eat the eggs. So a lot of the things that might prey on Colorado potato beetle will hit them at those life stages. So in the larval form or the egg form, um, the problem is, and this is a study that was done by the University of Minnesota recently, uh, what they did is that they actually looked at Colorado potato beetles and they did kind of put uh, a pollinator habitat or beneficial insect habitat here. Uh, and what they found was, is it really didn't affect the populations of the Colorado potato beetle. However, they were not able to find these kind of honchos in that new habitat. 
they did find beneficial insects that that could prey on eggs. So this 12 spotted um, lady beetle that we already kind of talked about has some uh, commitment issues, let's say. Uh, so they were able to find beneficial insects and, and spiders and things, but it, it they weren't particularly going after the Colorado potato beetle very much. So a little bit of sad research, but it's something that we got to take into account with Colorado potato beetles. We need to have some of these guys out there, the special ones. Very good. And the questions are coming in fast and mm -hmm. furious, but um, I do want to make sure that we get the evaluation into the, yep. into the chat. So please be sure, especially if you are looking for credit for the well-being program here, I'm going to just I think it's past these, yep. There we and go. Past that, yeah. If you want to get a certificate or well-being points, um, be sure to fill out that evaluation. Also be sure to, to um, fill out what future topics you're looking for. Um, here's the evaluation. I'll also send a follow-up email with Shane's presentation as well as any resources he referred to and this link again, but you can fill it out quite, quite easily. Be sure to engage with us. This is our last webinar during the April through um, the January through May series. And we'll start the May through August in a couple of weeks. So I will send the new link to the webinars as well. And Shane, do you have a couple of time, a little bit more time for a couple of questions? Yep, I can get a few more questions in, sure. Yeah, there's some questions about the a squash beetle. A squash bug. Squash bugs. Place? Yes. Yeah. Uh, good question. Now, a lot of the things that I've seen personally with squash bugs is, again, I'm seeing predators go after their eggs. Um, I would, don't have a lot of good information on hand right now, um, but I would suspect a, a, the, a lot of the predators uh, might go after that life stage, that egg life stage. But I, I need to probably sit down and do more research about squash bugs and, and beneficial insect effects. I did have some advanced warning with the Colorado potato beetle, uh, so I was able to get some slides up, uh, <laughs> but not, not for squash bugs, unfortunately. All right, thank you. And if you collect leaves in the spring for compost, will mm -hmm. this be beneficial to the, will beneficial insects be okay? Mm, depends, just like everything. Uh, if your most ho home compost piles don't get so hot that they would kill insects. You, you'll probably find ground beetles and other insects in there. Uh, but if you do have a really highly maintained compost pile, probably um, you are going to get to those really hot temperatures. So I don't, I, that's a good question. I don't have a good answer for you, unfortunately. Here's a milkweed question. They grow mm -hmm. milkweed for the monarchs, um, but there was a ton of wasp species, maybe hornets, mm -hmm. on the on milkweed leaves. Mm -hmm. Are they hanging out there to hunt, and do they bother the mo monarch larva? Um, now, with monarchs, they do have some predators. Uh, it's possible I'd have to kind of look and see what they were doing, like behavior-wise, because there are aphids and other things that can attract ants and wasps because of their um, honeydew. So <clears throat> that's a good question. I think a lot of the ones that I've been looking up in terms of of uh, parasites and parasitoids with monarchs. Um, a lot of times it hits the chrysalis. I've, I've seen some fly parasitoids and wasp parasitoids attack uh, monarchs at that life stage. Not so sure about the uh, caterpillar form. All right. And um, we are out of time, and mm. but we didn't, we're not out of questions. So Shane, <laughs> where can they go for more information on some of the questions that they have? Yeah, so I know in, in uh, hopefully, you know, most people are from Minnesota here. Uh, hopefully you have, or if you're in another state, contacting your local extension office would probably be my first uh, go-to. Uh, otherwise, Master Gardeners can also be a good source if you're having questions about uh, identification, you know, maybe give iNaturalist a try and, and some of the other things. And then, I don't know, our website is, is good for some of these articles, particularly our Yard and Garden News uh, is a good site to kind of write some of our, our papers. I know myself and my colleague, Marissa Shu, she's our integrated pest management. She's a big fan of wasps too. 
And I think she had a really good article uh, a few years ago that talked about, you know, benefits of wasps and how they get kind of a bad rap. Wonderful. Thank you so much. This was a wonderful presentation. A lot of great comments um, in the chat. We expect to see an email from me tomorrow. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.